The H-4 Hercules, the world's largest aquatic airplane. For over 72 years, it had the longest wingspan of any aircraft ever made by the hand of man. And surprisingly, it is made almost entirely out of wood. It was such an impossible feat of engineering that many people doubted it could fly at all. It was designed to carry troops and supplies across the North Atlantic during World War II. And it holds many fascinating innovations. Here now is the story of the amazing technological marvel that many have come to know as Howard Hughes's Spruce Goose. During the early years of World War II, it was essential to transport both supplies and troops to the battles happening in Europe. For this purpose, military vessels from both the US and UK were out at full capacity rushing to keep up with the difficult task. However, there was a formidable threat that they had to overcome. Enemy submarines were torpedoing any Allied ships that crossed their paths. Only the fastest vessels could escape their wrath. The RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth were the largest and fastest passenger ships ever built. Each of them were so fast they could carry 16,000 troops through submarine-infested waters, passing in and out of enemy range before they could fire a torpedo. But there simply weren't enough ships getting through this aquatic barricade. The American forces began to wonder if there was a way they could transport troops and supplies by air. In 1942, a request was given to Henry J. Kaiser, a shipbuilder most known for his World War II Liberty ships, for a cargo aircraft of immense proportions. Henry had conceived of an aquatic plane because there weren't many airstrips large enough for a craft of this size, nor would they be able to prevent the Axis forces from trying to bomb the runways. But there was one problem. Henry Kaiser did not have the capability of building such an airplane. So he turned to the one aviation expert that could accomplish such a monumental endeavor. Howard Hughes was a legend in his own right. He was a famous film producer, philanthropist, business tycoon, engineer, and record-setting pilot. The planes the Hughes Aircraft Company built featured innovations and technological advancements, seemingly with each model produced. That, combined with Howard Hughes's wealth and extreme attention to detail, made him the kind of man that often achieved the impossible. Together, Hughes and Kaiser began development of the HK-1, an abbreviation of their last names. There were many hurdles to overcome. First, due to the war effort and a shortage on various supplies that were prioritized for shipbuilding, the airplane's main building materials could not be of metal. Second, with the US military in short supply of engineers, aircraft fabricators, and metal workers, Hughes had to contend with building the airplane with a crew of cabinet makers and other non-aviation laborers. Third, the aircraft had to be designed to hold the equivalent of either two Sherman tanks or 750 troops. In other words, the carrying capacity had to be over 150,000 pounds. And finally, the plane had to be able to cross the Atlantic without stopping anywhere to refuel. Once the contract for three HK-1 prototypes was awarded, development began on the aircraft. It went through seven different design changes, often with Kaiser and Hughes clashing over the matter. Kaiser felt that Hughes was too much of a perfectionist and he partly blamed him for the reason it took 16 months to reach the construction phase. During war, Time is of the essence, and with Hughes constantly altering the designs or replacing them altogether, precious time was being wasted. The War Department began to lose their patience, and just as construction began on the airplane in 1944, Henry Kaiser pulled out of the partnership to work a separate contract to build new bombers for the war effort. Howard Hughes took over the HK-1 project, renaming it H-4 and his workers continued the monumental task of fabricating the massive vessel. The main building material was birch wood through a seven layer resin laminated process called Duramold. The extremely thin wood veneers were built by an army of female laborers at Roddus Manufacturing in Marshfield, Wisconsin. The result was a very thin but strong wood laminate that would act as an outer shell for the airship that could replace the otherwise widely used aluminum cladding. The frames and beams of the vessel were also made of a similar laminate since it was stronger and lighter than the lumber of the same dimensions and weight. 
The massive wings, each wide enough to shade a house and long enough to surpass the height of 11-story high-rise building, would have to be strong enough to endure stresses that no aircraft in history had to endure before. To ensure the wings would not break away from the airship during flight, they were cantilevered off of each other by being bolted to a massive V-shaped center frame that was tied together with steel straps for added strength and rigidity. And to give you an idea of size, the floaters on the wings were each larger than the fuselage of a single-engine biplane. Originally, the H-4 would have loaded its cargo by docking the nose up to a wharf, and the forward end of the fuselage would have opened, providing direct access for tanks to drive up inside. However, this special type of nose was never installed because by the time the builders got around to it, the airplane was no longer needed for the war effort. But Hughes kept on building. He wanted to see this monumental behemoth completed to prove that such an impossible feat could be done. Once all the laminate was laid over the framework, it was carefully sanded smooth by hand, and then a layer of very thin canvas was covered over it, then painted with a metallic aluminum color. With an airship of this size, and built of the flammable materials it was, Hughes felt that handheld fire extinguishers were not sufficient enough for safety. He had a complex system of CO2 tanks installed, designed so it could supply a steady stream to suppress any fire that broke out. The fuel tanks for the airplane were stored in the belly of the aircraft. There were 14 tanks, each with a capacity of 1,000 gallons, and they were placed between the heavy-duty frames of the structure. To propel this massive airship, Hughes ordered eight Pratt & Whitney R4360 engines, each rated for 3,000 horsepower, with a combined total output of 24,000. They were the largest radial reciprocating aircraft engines ever built, and they each turned a Hamilton standard propeller, each set measuring 17 feet in diameter. The four inboard propellers had reverse pitch capabilities to allow the flying boat to back away from a war for dock. The aircraft was so massive that no manual system of levers and pulleys could have moved the wing and tail flaps. The H-4 would become the first airplane to ever use a hydraulic system for maneuverability. Finally, in late 1947, the H-4 was completed, and Hughes hired a house-moving company to transport the plane in sections from his facility in Los Angeles to Pier E in the city of Long Beach. There, the plane was assembled and a specialized hangar was constructed around it. The press were all over the story. Everyone wanted to see this legendary flying machine that was officially named H-4 Hercules. And Herculean it was. From nose to tail, it stretched 218 feet, which is 66.5 meters. And from belly to top of the tail fin, it towered 80 feet, 24 meters. Hughes had created a behemoth of an airship, the largest in the world. At the time, one of the largest airplanes in the sky was the Boeing 377 with a wingspan of 131 feet, 40 meters, and a gross weight of 145,000 pounds. But Howard Hughes's H-4 Hercules is almost three times the size, with a wingspan of 320 feet, 97 and a half meters, and a gross weight of 400,000 pounds. No one had ever seen any aircraft of this size before, and being that it was made almost entirely out of wood, everyone doubted that it could even fly. Newspapers dubbed it all kinds of nicknames, like the Flying Lumberyard, or Hughes's least favorite, the Spruce Goose, a name which he felt was insulting to the builders, especially since the airship was actually made of birch. The Hercules had cost the US War Department $22 million, and when their funding went dry, Howard Hughes spent 18 million of his own money to finish it. Unfortunately, when the H-4 Hercules was completed, the war had long been over, and Hughes was called to testify before the Senate War Investigating Committee to prove to them that the aircraft wasn't just a front for laundering the federal funds given to him. Hughes famously stated, I've put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. The committee agreed to adjourn the meeting, and during that time, Hughes had scheduled test runs of the Hercules. The aircraft was floated out of the hangar and into Long Beach Harbor. The plan was to taxi the plane across the water several times, testing its maneuverability, 
its engine power, and its speed and responsiveness to controls. The public wanted to see this gargantuan enigma, and the press was on hand to exploit the occasion. Many were secretly hoping to watch the aircraft take off into the air, but were disappointed when Hughes continued to insist it was just taxiing across the water. The first taxi run went smoothly, with Hughes pushing the plane to 45 miles per hour. The second run was 70 miles per hour. The nation was watching, full of doubt and full of uncertainty about the great machine he built. If he couldn't convince the war investigating committee that the Hercules was a functional aircraft, then he would be in hot water with the US government. On the third run, Hughes again pushed the speed, taxiing for a mile at a speed of 95 miles per hour, and called for 15 degrees of flaps. Those who were listening in on the radio suddenly realized he intended to take off. The few cameras that had not been put away started rolling again. Everyone watched with disbelief as Howard pulled back on the yoke and the plane gracefully lifted out of the water. The H-4 Hercules, the largest aircraft ever built to that point, was now in the air, flying at a speed of 120 miles per hour and gliding above the water at an altitude of 70 feet. Howard Hughes had achieved the impossible. Just a minute later, he set the plane gently down into the water. With a simple test flight, Hughes had shut down all the naysayers and vindicated his use of government funds for a project that was now deemed legitimate. That day, the massive flying boat Hercules had made history, and that was the very first and the very last time it would ever take to the skies. Hughes turned to his co-pilot, David Grant, and said, Boy, the flaps really balloon this thing. It seemed the ease at which the plane leapt into the air had surprised even Howard. The plane was carefully maneuvered back into its custom hangar on Pier E. The hangar itself was designed to permit the plane to float out from the front, and the building itself was climate controlled in order to preserve the condition of the aircraft. On the drive back to Los Angeles, Hughes's chief designer turned to him and said, Howard, did you intend to fly that thing today? He gave him a coy smirk and responded, you'll never know. There is debate out there about the validity of the Hercules' ability to fly. Many say she flew low enough that technically she was carried by ground effect and possibly wouldn't have fared too well at high altitude. We'll never have the chance to figure it out for certain, but Howard Hughes was an aviation genius and perfectionist. Many of the technologies he invented for his aircrafts are now commonplace today. If his reputation has anything to say about the Spruce Goose's ability to fly across the Atlantic, then it's possible it very well could have. But the point was, the Hercules lifted out of the water by a matter of 70 feet. That alone was enough to prove to the Senate committee that the project was a legitimate one with a provable achievement. Hughes had always intended to fly the aircraft again especially if the government had decided it was useful and wanted to run tests, but the opportunity never arose. While the government technically owned the Hercules and didn't intend to use it, Howard alone saw the gravity of its importance to aviation achievement. At his own expense, he kept the H-4 maintained in flight-ready condition at a cost of $1 million per year and a staff of 300 running the facility. The terms of their employment required complete confidentiality, and no one was allowed to photograph or film the inside of the hangar or even the plane itself. So for decades afterward, the public never again got to see this wooden Goliath with their own eyes. When Howard Hughes died in 1976, it came time to decide what would happen to the Hercules. Nearly five years of debates took place between the US government, the Hughes company, the Hughes private estate, aviation preservationists, and the National Air and Space Museum. At one point, it was almost decided to cut up the aircraft and send its pieces to the various organizations for display. Finally, the matter was settled. The H-4 Hercules would be sold, intact, to the Aero Club of Southern California. The club had then made agreements with Rather Corporation to permanently display the airplane in a custom-built dome next to the retired ocean liner RMS Queen Mary. 
Jack Rather and his company leased the ocean liner from the city of Long Beach, and part of that lease was the intended development of the land surrounding the ship. In the year 1980, work began on moving the old wooden aircraft out of its tired hangar. The world's largest floating crane, called Herman the German, lifted the plane out of the water and placed it in a temporary storage area while the new dome structure was being built. At last, in February of 1982, it was time to float the Hercules through the harbor on a barge to its new location where they backed it into the dome and sealed up the structure after it. And for 10 years, the two attractions worked in tandem to draw tourists to the beachside city. The airplane was displayed and advertised with its catchy, albeit insulting nickname, the Spruce Goose. When 1989 came around, the Walt Disney Company bought out the Ratherport Corporation with the hope of gaining ownership of the Disneyland Hotel. When they acquired his company, they also inherited the lease to the RMS Queen Mary and the land on which the Hercules was displayed. But their plans for the property never included maintaining the aircraft. Instead, they wanted to build a massive theme park complex on the waterfront. The Disney Company alerted the Aero Club that the Spruce Goose would need to find a new home, which put them in a panic. Who would take an aircraft of such immense size, and would they be crazy enough to pay for transporting it? Dell Smith was the founder of Evergreen International Aviation. He and his son, Captain Michael King Smith, were both aviation enthusiasts and big fans of the H-4 Hercules. They both had a dream to build an aviation museum showing off their collections of aircraft. And the crowning touch, the central attraction, would be the Spruce Goose. The story of the acquisition and transport of the flying boat to their facility in McMinnville, Oregon, is a whole story of its own. And for that, I would refer to a video by Peter Dibble that delves into the extensive details of such an operation. But to summarize, it took nine months between 1992 and 1993 to disassemble the airplane into large pieces that would be floated by barge almost 1,200 miles up the west coast to Portland, Oregon, where it was then loaded onto three smaller barges that brought the airplane down the Willamette River 60 miles south to Weston Bar, where the plane would take its last leg of the journey over land to the Evergreen headquarters. While the plane sat in a temporary storage facility, the pieces were carefully restored while the museum building was constructed across the highway. Once the building was ready, the large pieces were then brought inside and carefully reassembled. It wouldn't be until June 6, 2001 that the museum would open and the public would finally be able to see the Hercules again after nine years of absence. Over two decades later, the airplane still sits on display in pristine condition, sitting on a custom support rig and towering over all other aircraft in the building. The massive wings shade the smaller airplanes and stretch almost to the walls of the structure. Each one is large enough for a tall person to stand up inside. The tail fins of the Spruce Goose have a larger span than that of the massive DC-3 sitting just behind it. The H-4 Hercules is a monument of engineering, one that really can't be fully appreciated until you experience it for yourself. Accompanying this video is a fully narrated walkthrough tour of the airship, complete with interesting facts about the quirky details of its construction. It is the largest flying boat ever built and had the largest wingspan of any plane in existence until the introduction of the Strato launch in 2019. And what's more mind-boggling about it all is how the airship is made almost entirely from laminated birchwood veneer. It exists today as a modern marvel, displayed before you at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon. A testament to the realization of an idea that had otherwise been deemed impossible. Thank you for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and comment below. For more stories on the architecture, engineering, and history of the Steam Age, make sure to subscribe. You can support me by either becoming a Patreon member or channel member, or you can help donate to my transatlantic voyage to the UK. Links and information are in the description below. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time.